Hello, Minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. So glad you could join me today. Well, today all we're going to do is we're going to look at some things. I got some new, new to me, uh, super granulating paints. We're going to look at that. There is a brand new masking fluid on the market. Again, new to me. That is Schminka. So we'll do that next and then we're going to look at a website uh probably one of the most impressive watercolor resources i have ever seen so hold on for that I, we'll do that at the end but first of all we're going to look at uh the super granulating paints now i have uh, done a review on some of these paints i'll put a link down in the description if you want to see that initial review i have not collected all of them I find them enormously fun. Uh, these were the first ones I collected. There was a galaxy set, a glacier set, and a deep sea set in the original releases. And I picked uh, these. The super granulating paints, for those of you who are new to it and don't know anything about it, are a mix of two pigments. Usually one that uh, granulates and one that does not granulate or does much less so. Granulating paints and less or non-granulating paints tend to separate because they're different weights. So the water will carry the lighter pigment. The heavier pigment will settle out into granules. So they'll combine two pigments. And a lot of times they're very contrasty pigments. Like you can see here, this is actually galaxy brown. Here it is again. There's a blue, bluish pigment in there. Same with this glacier brown. Here's another one, the deep sea. You can see the blue and the green. You can see the green does not really granulate as much and travels further than the blue. So they tend to separate. So it's sort of a special effect, I guess you might say, a special effect pigment. But they're enormously fun to play with. There are several sets. Um, I have not collected them all, and I'm not going to. There's a lot of redundancy in the color. This was a little, uh, as a recap, this was just a little um, spontaneous study that I did. This was another one. Uh, then they came out with the Tundra set and the Forest set. Again, I did not buy all of those in those sets, just the ones that interested me. Some really neat colors. I mean, look at that Tundra violet. It's just gorgeous. Tundra pink, Tundra green, Forest blue. That was another set, the Forest set. Force gray and force blue. They have more sets yet now. I've been trying to make my way through all the sets and decide if there's any out of those sets that I really want. But again, I emphasize uh, there's a lot of redundancy. So you may want to go and just kind of check out the individual colors. However, there is one site that fanboy me could not resist, and that is the Shire set. And that is what we have brand new here before us. And I bought the whole set. Now, they have two sizes. These, these smaller, what I would call a sampler set, are 5 milliliters. This is their normal tube size, which is 15 milliliters. And everything I've bought so far has been that. But I decided, oh, I want to just check out the entire Shire set because they're all greens. Yeah, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. Big time. So. You had me with Shire, okay? Shire yellow, Shire olive, Shire green, Shire blue, and Shire, Shire gray. But they're all sort of greenish colors, maybe not so much with the Shire gray. Painting a lot of landscapes, of course, I use a lot of green. So this interested me. Anyway, I thought maybe you would like to see them. I know these are not super new. Um, there are others out there who have done probably really good reviews on the Shire colors. So go check those out. I'm going to take this page here, which I've already done some uh, doodling. This is These colors are super granulating, but they're not from this set. I think these are from the Tundra set, maybe. I don't know, but uh, I'm going to come over here with this and do some swatching for the Shire colors. First of all, though, I'm going to label this page so I know what they are. I'll just have a little fun with it. Let's get out. I'll just have a calligraphy marker here, a green calligraphy marker. We're just going to use Bilbo's font. This is just sort of an unchel. I usually use the dots over the A, but I'm going to put dots at the end. Put a little dot right there. Shire! 
Yeah, I'm a Lord of the Rings nerd of the first order. So am I, dear boy. I've read the books, all the books, a couple times at least. I've been watching the movies for years. So all Schminka had to do was put Shire on a box and I would have bought it. Sad. Sad. All right, well, let's watch these out real quick and see what we have. I've already squirted them out. These are actually dry. I did this last night. So we're going to start out here with Shire Yellow. A very earthy uh, yellow green, actually. I love this initially uh, because it reminds me of sort of a grayed version of Azo Green or Azo Nickel Yellow. What I like to do is just a straight up swatch. The super granulating paints don't really granulate a lot or separate in a fairly straightforward dry wash. And I've mentioned that in my other video. What you have to do to get uh, super granulating paints to do their thing is to put a lot of pigment down. With a lot of water, you will start to see the separation. Maybe do some charging in. Some wet and wet charging in. Now you're starting to see that separation. And now we're getting a glare. See? See the pigment separating? The lighter pigment usually travels with the water. Very interesting. See, uh, that's separating out some of it there. It looks like a purple. Let's actually read it and see. PY159 and PV62. So yeah, the yellow and a violet. Makes sense. So those are kind of compliments, and that gives you this kind of grayed yellow, yellowish green. All right, let's move on to Shire Green. Let's take a look at what it is. PY159 and PB35. All right, well, that's probably good enough. And we're going to go down here, paint a really wet swatch. Again, sorry for the glare. Let me tilt that a little bit. You can see the uh, colors starting to separate. They're even doing it up here. I didn't do a very good job of getting that flat. Just a very nice uh, yellow green. Not as earthy, a little more brilliant. If they're close, you can really see the granulation, which I like over here where it's starting to dry the little rivulets. That's one of the cool things that granulation does. So here you have a cooler green separating out from the yellower green. That's doing it even in this kind of flat swatch. Really neat stuff. Okay, moving on. Now I misspoke. This is Shire Olive. So Shire Yellow, Shire Olive. What I'm getting ready to do next is Shire Green. So a little bit of a difference. This is a much cooler green, much warmer green there. So let's make our wet swatch. Get it up here out of the glare. And Shire Green is PY159. Same yellow is, appear is appearing in all of these. PY159, which is like a deep lemon yellow, and PG18. That's a Viridian, if I'm not mistaken. In every case, you can see the yellow. Looks like it, it settles out. Looks like the deeper color travels a little further. Not as much separation. I've, got, I've gotten the most out of here. Sometimes if you tilt it back, let it run back, let it move around, you'll start to see more of that granulation separation. It's just fun. To play with these and if you have a wash you know that's a broad wash where you don't mind some texture uh these are just great to to stand in for maybe a single solid color when these are all totally dry we'll take another look let's move on to shire blue surprise surprise now shire blue is three colors so that's going to be interesting it's that same py 159 sort of a deep lemon yellow PB29, almost everybody who knows pigments recognizes that. That's ultramarine blue. And PG26. What is PG26? That one I have to look up. Oh, it's cobalt green. So three colors here. We ought to see some interesting granulation and maybe some separation. All right, there's our more or less solid swatch. Let's go down here with a wet swatch. And see what magic happens. Let's see what's happening there. I, I definitely see two distinct colors. 
Let me let those washes move around. Usually when uh, ultramarine blue separates out, you can clearly see it. If you saw my last episode on the granulating sky, the ultramarine separated out pretty distinctly and brilliantly. So that's a component in this one. So yeah, we're getting a lot of separation there. That's really neat. Great color so far. Worthy of the Shire. For things are made to endure in the Shire. All right, lastly, we have Shire Gray. A very smoky gray. Kind of a cool gray. All right, that's a pretty gray. And by the way, those pigments are... Again, we have three PY159, yet again, that, uh, that lemony yellow. PB74. What is PB74, you say? That's a deep cobalt blue. And then PBK11, which is a Mars black. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of granulation with that, because Mars black is usually pretty heavily granulating. Mars black is one of those that you can add to almost any color and get a really cool granulating effect. So, let's do our wet swatch and see what materializes. Drop some more water in there, get moving around. You can definitely see the granulation happening. One of the things I've noticed in my time uh, using all the super granulating paints, most of them, is uh, you don't clearly see what's happening until they dry. It's an interesting thing. Um, once they dry, a lot of times the varying colors will become a little more evident. So I'm not seeing any of the yellow, but I do see the black and the blue. There is a little bit of warmth, I guess, to uh, some of these grayer areas out here. So I suppose that could be due to the yellow. I'm going to go ahead and hit it with a heat gun. All right, there you have it. Shire gray. Yeah, out here we have a fairly warm gray. And it gets cooler as you get into some of these uh, blue passages, cobalt blue. So. The yellow is playing its part, but not as visibly as it is uh, in these. And you can definitely see that Mars black pigment. And that is the most heavily granulating part, I think. But cool. In the future, we'll have to do something with these just for fun. But I'm happy with them. Uh, I think probably if I bought any in bigger tubes, it would probably be this one, this one, and this one. These three interest me the most. Although that gray is pretty cool, too. Well, there's two others, and I'm not sure if I'm going to get any colors with the, with those sets. But there is the Haze set and the Volcano set. I've been kind of looking at them with a side eye. We'll see. If I do get any of those, I'll share them with you. But, I mean, I have a pretty good collection of super granulating paint now just by picking and choosing. And so you can do that. You can really pick and choose colors. Uh, um, they are very overlapping. I just, I want to emphasize that. All right. What do we have next? I was made aware of this. This is a Schmincke masking fluid. If you use masking fluids, you know there's a lot of them on the market, but primarily they're all the same thing. They're just a latex rubber with, I think, an ammonia-based solvent. Latex masking fluid is what it is. It's what we've used for years and years. It stinks to high heaven, and it tends to go bad quickly. Now, is this the something better? Well, I hope so, but I don't know. This is an ammonia-free masking fluid, and it uses a rosin uh, dispersion. That's their language. Synthetic rosin dispersion with no ammonia. This is going to be a first try with this. Really, uh, long term is going to tell whether this is better. Uh, this is the only thing I could get my hands on in time for this review. Uh, this is a little sort of a dropper bottle applicator. It's it's very fine point. But there is also a jar version like this for painting it on. I've ordered some of that. We'll see when it gets here. For now, this is what I can test. And I still have probably all the questions you're going to have. You can actually draw with this applicator, which uh, the control is not great, but for this test and review it'll do. I really can't control the width or the fineness of the line. A traditional masking fluid um, 
Latex masking fluid starts to dry immediately. So I guess that's that's one of the first questions I have. Can you go through? I wish that mask actually dried a little slower so that you can continue to do what I'm doing here and paint with it. It's starting to, it does dry pretty quick. But masking fluid will start to dry and then you'll start peeling up the mask you've already applied. It's a little frustrating. Right away, this doesn't seem to do that as much. But again, as I was starting to say, I have probably all the same questions you have. What's the shelf life going to be like? Will this ever uh, start to go bad and then stain my paper? I don't know. We're just going to make some little kind of grassy, branchy things here. If you're, put, if you're wanting to put down some broad shapes and broad, in other words, not fine detail, this applicator tip's not bad. I mean, you can, you can fill in areas with it. Can't really do very fine lines with it. Okay, so I've got a brush out here. I decided while I'm letting this dry, I was going to test. This is pretty much a throwaway brush if it needs to be. And I am thinning it a little bit, but I've not soaked it up. Usually if you're using latex max, you mask, you would need to soap it. But I'm thinning it a bit. I'm going to see if that's a problem. Definitely have the control you need for the brush. Because latex will almost instantly ruin a brush. It is devil to get out. I mean, you can use solvents, but most brushes uh, usually sticks to the fibers. I want to see what the hap what happens with this, and also how well this uh, thinned out mask comes out once we're done painting. It's interesting because it really thins out almost like an acrylic paint. I mean, that will be if that is something you can do. Paint with it makes a reliable mask, and then clean your brush out. That's a game changer, folks. I mean, it was literally a game changer. And then if on top of that, you end up with a better shelf life, what more could you ask for? Well, we'll see. We shall see. Cautiously optimistic, let's just say. And these are the areas. You can see the areas I painted with the brush. That wasn't a great brush. It didn't have a great point. But I thinned the mask, and we'll see. We'll see if that all comes up just fine. All right, looks like we are dry here. So let's throw some paint on this thing and then see how it lifts. All right, I'll put this up on the easel. Hopefully you can see it a little better. I'm going to use my standard way of taking mask up with uh, the latex mask. We'll see if it works with this. And it does. I know a lot of people use their fingers to remove masks. I have never ever liked that method. It works. Actually, it's not working as well. It's coming up fine, folks. Now, what you what I'm getting is more like eraser crumbs than the long kind of stringy, rubbery things you get with latex masks, which will it'll come up. It'll look almost like a rubber band when you pull it up. This is coming up more like uh, eraser crumbs. And look, these fine thinned out with water areas they are coming up just great holy moly well i'm mildly excited you have a mask that you can thin a little bit like acrylic use it in a brush and it won't ruin your brush i mean stink what more do you want i am definitely going to be testing this mask in various ways over time Time is going to be really the only thing that tells me about shelf life. But I'm just really uh, right now impressed with the thin areas or the areas I thinned out with water and painted with a brush. Well, I may go back and paint this, <laughs> the rest of that at a later time. I just wanted to do that test because uh, I've got more to show you. All right, real quick, I decided since this has the potential of being a real game changer, I'm going to go ahead and let this brush be potentially sacrificial. I want to see how well dried in mask can clean out of this. And I'm going to leave it right there to dry all that mask in there. And if that cleans out easily with soap and water, fingers crossed, this is a game changer. All right, so I want you to see this. I mean, this is amazing. I completely covered, coated all the fibers in this brush with that rosin-based masking fluid. I just went to the sink 
and with hot water and hand soap, all of it washed out. That is incredible. And as I said before, that's a game changer. And I figured I better test that before ending this video. Wow. Just wow. I mean, if you can apply mask with a brush without ruining your brush or any laborious solvent cleanup, that is huge. And the control you get with a brush and applying masking fluid is fantastic. And being able to thin it, very, very nice. Yeah, so Schmincke ammonia-free masking fluid. Uh, apparently, because I'm not getting any uh, smell. It is odor-free, it seems. Looking forward to using this more. Now on to our last feature. All right, last thing I wanted to talk about was online resources for watercolor, but one thing in particular. Now, if you've been around uh, the internet for long looking for watercolor resources, you probably are aware of Handprint. Handprint for years has been just the go-to for watercolor and pigment information. The gentleman that did this site uh, has just a really good database talking about watercolor pigments. And you know, they're, they're broken down into the different color categories. And he has a lot of information, uh, a lot of information about uh, light fastness characteristics. Only one problem, and that is it's an old site and he has not updated it for years literally decades. So it's an aging site. It doesn't take into account any of the newer pigments on the market. Another really great uh, resource is Color of Art Pigment Database. Uh, once again, it's just uh, a nice listing. You've got all of the uh, color pigment numbers. I've been here many times just to look up particular pigments. Uh, the only thing about it is, is it's not uh, real user friendly. Everything is by pigment, so you've got uh, really no uh, brand database, not really uh, specific to watercolor. So just recently, uh, I happened to see, and uh, if you're at all familiar with YouTube and color, and you're interested in color and watercolor, and you've looked for resources to tell you what colors to buy, no doubt you've come across Dr. Otto Cano's website or at least her YouTube channel. Dr. Otto Cano is just a fantastic resource. She has been for years just quietly over there on her YouTube channel, testing, buying, commenting on, swatching literally every watercolor pigment there is out there. So I was really, really pleased to see that she had just launched this website. And to my knowledge, it's the most up-to-date, most extensive, watercolor pigment database out there and I'm just absolutely blown away it's amazing now I understand why she sits over there on her channel and swatches endlessly it's not something I could do but again it is such a resource for us uh, when we need it now here's what's cool about this website she's got it broken down watercolors by pigment watercolors by brand so you can search either way and I think that's really helpful. And most of her information, as far as I can tell, is just up to the minute. And she is actively trying to keep it updated and add to it. Now, let's look real close at brand. So you click on uh, watercolor by brand. And, and I love that this is specific to watercolor. Again, very similar to handprint and how, how much we've loved being able to access the information on handprint, but it's in a much friendlier, easier to navigate uh, type of site. So, all right, let's go to my favorite, Mgram. So if you click on a brand that you love, you immediately will come up with this information right here. Country of origin, how many colors, sing single pigment colors, that's useful. Honey or not, yes, contains honey, vegan or not. Not vegan, official website, she gives you that. No color chart, but as I understand it, and they do have a color chart, She's, as I understand it, she's actively updating this and populating these things. So if there's something specific you wanna see, like there's a brand that you use and she's not filled in a particular thing, let her know, she's uh, very open to that. And by the way, I will put a link down below to her launch video. She just launched this 
a few days ago. Information from their website, her verdict, basically uh, how she assesses this brand. She's got uh, a link to her series, I'm assuming YouTube series. And then there's the database. And here's where things just really, really kind of blew me away. It starts off with a key. Uh, the staining characteristics, the granulating characteristics, and the transparency or opacity, and then goes through the entire line. I'm so impressed by this, and I just had to review this because I'm hoping uh, you, my viewers out there, will go support this. We'll use it, tell her how much you appreciate it, you know, if you can lend some monetary support, do, because this kind of work just takes a lot of work. Let's go down here and look at a color I use a lot. PV19, Quinacridone Rose. Love that color. It's got the pigment there, the name, a uh, link again to, I'm assuming, the Ingram's website. She's got affiliate links, so that's one way you can support her is by using these affiliate links to buy the paint if you're, if you're shopping for paint. She's got a video link, so when you click that, it takes you to a video where uh, it features that color and the actual testing she did. And you can hear her real-time comments there. So that's an interesting and very unique feature. Again, oh my goodness, the work and the thought that has gone into this is, is just blowing my mind. Back to the website. Then uh, she has a link to the swatch if she has one. Full, wonderfully scanned swatch with, again, all of this information on a pigment. So just how badly we need something like this, have needed something like this. Oh, and by the way, uh, Dr. Kano has not asked me to do any of this. She's not even uh, told me or reached out to me about this site. It's just something I happened to see in my YouTube feed one day, and I thought, whoa. So let's go back uh, just for a minute and let's look at watercolor by pigment and see how that works. So here are your colors. So you can look up any pigment. Uh, let's say you have a pigment number and you didn't know what it was. Let's click on blue. And up comes the page for blue and then here listed or all the common pigment numbers for blue. PB29, again a very familiar pigment for most of us ultramarine blue and now we're arranged by pigment number so we're seeing all the brands that she's tested for ultramarine and all of their characteristics again uh, the characteristics over here that match up to that that key that legend that's here at the beginning of each uh, category so we'll take uh, an example We'll go down to the standard. She's got French Ultramarine. We'll go down to the standard Ultramarine Blue. Daniel Smith video. Now you can see no swatch there for that. Again, uh, she has mentioned that she will start populating some of these that are not populated. A light fastness rating. Staining rating. Granulation rating. Transparency rating. And an indication of if it's vegan or not. So again, uh, not much more I can say about this. You just need to go check it out and play around with it a bit. It's simply autocano.com. And on YouTube, she's also autocano if you've never been to her uh, YouTube channel. She's got a donation button here. You can also, I think, donate on her YouTube channel. I don't know if she has that enabled or not. I believe she does. Anyway, I hope you'll give it a look. I also hope you'll tell her how much you appreciate this resource. And I hope it's something that's useful for you, because it sure is going to be for me. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate all my viewers for the time you spent watching my channel. Thank you so much, patrons, for your support of this channel. We'll see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.